This podcast contains sensitive topics and discussions. Listener discretion is advised. A young mother is savagely murdered in her own home, leaving little evidence and no witnesses. But investigators would find her killer through the most unlikely testimony. This is the Sparkle Ray story. Hi, Amy. How are you today? Hey, Megan. I'm doing well. I have to tell you, I've never heard of this case at all. In fact, that's a very unique name I would have remembered. Where do you hear about this one? I'm glad you asked. I do remember it, like a hint of it from a long time ago. But I also listen to a podcast that I think you listen to sometimes, Black Girl Gone. Yep. Yeah, that's a really good podcast. And I heard this case on that show. I thought it was well told. I thought it was kind of an important story and it has cultural implications that I appreciated uh, a little bit different in terms of the theory that we usually discuss. So I thought it was an interesting case that I wanted to cover. I think what's great sometimes is that you have a mystery case, right? And you think it's a mystery and you think it's going to go unsolved, but then someone very unlikely comes forward, right? And helps contribute to the case. So I think that's also a nice aspect of some of our cases. And based on feedback, a lot of listeners don't like unsolved cases. They're important to highlight because you want to keep the story alive to get more tips about a case. But a lot of listeners, they want to know that something's been resolved. I'm so aware of that. My mom consistently calls me just so you know, to let me know. I liked that case, but I really don't like it when they're not solved. And I'm like, well, mom, that's not the reality of the case. So I can't, you know, solve every single case. And we have to, we absolutely have to highlight those that are unsolved to help solve them, right? Yeah. And Megan, speaking of uh, forgetting, you know, sometimes I forget that our families listen to this show. So every now and then I'll be surprised by a comment. I I don't think I mentioned to you how Alan said, oh, so Toby's the love of your life. And I was, what are you talking about? I guess in a, Toby a previous episode, I talked about how Toby, my dog, is the love of my life. So <laughs> I forgot actually. my husband listens. Sorry, Alan, you're the love of my life. He's the fur love of my life. Yeah, you should have clarified that. And I do remember you saying that exactly. <laughs> Good for Alan for picking up on that. Moving on from that note, today's case centers around a mother who had just started a new family and had so much to look forward to, only for it to be taken away at such a young age. And it's such a tragedy, especially all of these cases are tragic in some way. But when you have a new young family just beginning their life, you know, just excited for the future, it almost compounds the tragedy. And her family also had to wait a long time for justice, and we will discuss whether or not justice has been served in the end. For now, let's meet Sparkle Rye. Born Sparkle Reed in March of 1978, Sparkle was raised by her father Bennett along with her younger sister in Atlanta, Georgia. Sparkle was very close with her father and her younger sister, who she really helped to raise. Her mother was not in the picture, and there's not much reported about the relationship. Nevertheless, the three of them were a very tight family unit. And then when Sparkle was about 16 years old, Amy, her father met and married a woman named Donna Lowry and Sparkle gained a seven-year-old stepsister. Now, you might think offhand that this could produce some friction, right? It was just her father and her and she was kind of a mother to her younger sister. But in fact, it was just the opposite. She bonded with Donna very quickly. She bonded with her stepsister. They were very, very close. And though blended, they were really the epitome of a happy, tight-knit family. How far in age were they? Sparkle was 16 years old, and her stepsister was seven years old at the time. Oh, that's fun. And remember, Sparkle also had another younger sister. So Mm -hmm. it was almost like she was like a little mother figure or just Mm -hmm. like the consummate older sister. Mm -hmm. And again, though blended, they were very, very tight-knit. Sparkle was a very smart and involved teenager who was a good student and a member of her high school cheerleading team. She was very well-rounded, so I don't think it was a big surprise that she got a scholarship to college. But unfortunately, Amy, her time in university didn't last. You know, she was away for the first time without supervision, and in that capacity, Sparkle lost focus of her studies and ended up losing her scholarship, which we often see happens to students, right? They just wind up having a little too much fun and not focusing on studies as much as they should. 
So did she leave school then because she couldn't afford it? or Unfortunately, yeah. she did, yes. She did leave school, but she wasn't ready to go home. Even though she had a great relationship with Bennett and Donna, she just didn't want to go back home yet. She was feeling a little bit independent for the first time. So she wound up going to live with her grandmother in Louisville, Kentucky. And while she was there, she took a job working at the front desk of a hotel. So she got a job right away. At this job, she met and began dating her manager, Rajiv Rai who was 18 years old at the time. Rajiv went by Ricky. So Ricky, just like Sparkle, also began college, but he did not finish school like his siblings and his father, who were very academically successful. He had several siblings and his dad all achieved high status in school. Sparkle is around the same age at this time, correct? Yes, she's a little bit older than Ricky. I believe Sparkle was 19 years old at the time and close to 20. And, you know, it might have been the fact that they had, you know, this in common, that they both were around the same age. They both had began school. They both wound up in the same type of employment. But things began moving pretty quickly between the pair. And they fell in love after a very short time. And while they wanted to get married, I mean, they were both young. Ricky was concerned, but he had concerns that related to other factors than age. You see, Ricky was Indian and his parents would not approve of Sparkle as they were more traditional and believed in arranged marriages. But despite the family's disapproval, Ricky continued to see Sparkle over the winter holidays. So that would be probably about five or six months into the pair dating. Sparkle returned to Georgia to visit her parents and she told her family about Ricky and how in love the two were. And by February, Sparkle called home to give her parents some big news, Amy. She was pregnant. However, her parents were not as overjoyed as she expected. They were concerned because she was quite young and Ricky had only been dating a short time. And the fact that neither of them had college degrees was also very concerning to Sparkle's parents. I would assume that Ricky's parents were also not happy about this. Yes. While Sparkle's parents were not thrilled, they were supportive in the end because they were a tight knit family. But Ricky's parents were an entirely different story. They were infuriated that he'd continue dating Sparkle so much so that Ricky didn't even tell them that Sparkle was expecting. Oh, yes. I mean, it created such a rift that the couple Sparkle and Ricky moved to Atlanta in May of 1999 in order to be closer to Sparkle's family. While there, Sparkle's parents helped Ricky find a steady job in Columbus, Georgia, and the couple moved there shortly after Ricky got this job. He was a hard worker. Sparkle's family was willing to help him as well. I mean, they rallied around the couple. And I'm assuming they are not talking to Ricky's family at all? No. At this point? No, they are not. They're not in communication. Their baby girl, Anala, which means the fiery one in Indian, was born in October 1999, and both Ricky and Sparkle were thrilled by all accounts. The couple appeared to be doing well, and they were happy. Ricky had a steady job, Sparkle was a stay-at-home mother, and so the two began to plan their wedding. But in the midst of this happiness, Ricky received some very shocking and very sad news. You see, his father had passed away from an unexpected and quick illness related to diabetes. And though his father had not been supportive of Ricky and Sparkle, Ricky was devastated. He was very close with his dad and he would have to travel to India to attend the funeral. So he went, leaving Sparkle and Anala in Georgia. But when he returned, it wasn't long before another tragedy struck. A horrible tornado had hit India at that time. And unbelievably, this tornado killed both Ricky's mother and his uncle who had stayed behind to settle his father's affairs. Oh, my goodness. I mean, this was the most shocking and upsetting news possible. So he lost both of his parents. It was a short period of time. Yes. Within just weeks, we are talking about. Wow. He was devastated. Sparkle's family, who was very close with Ricky, they were devastated for him. They felt terrible. So did Sparkle. Mm -hmm. Everybody felt really bad for Ricky at this time. Despite these horrific circumstances, the couple went through with their wedding in March of 2000 though none of Ricky's family would be in attendance. The fact that there was tragedy that struck, that his parents had passed away, his siblings, he, I I don't know if they were tending to other matters, but I don't think everyone was also aware, his siblings, about his situation with Sparkle. And the wedded bliss that would be, you remember they were so excited for this wedding and everyone was happy that day, unfortunately would be very short-lived for the couple. You see, just after the wedding, and by just after, Amy, I mean the same day, 
Sparkle's father, Bennett, received a call from another family who said that Ricky's mother was looking for him. Okay. How can that be, you might ask, right? Well, I'm I'm imagining the story is unfolding in a different way than I thought. Yes, because Ricky's mother has passed away in this awful tornado. Or so we thought. Or so we thought. And their family, I mean, Sparkle's family thought this had to be a mistake as well, you know. But Bennett told Sparkle that something just wasn't right. The family member, it was like a friend, it was a family member or a friend, someone who knew Ricky's family, seemed pretty positive that it was Ricky's mother who was looking for him. And when Sparkle and her family decided to confront Ricky about this, he adamantly denied that he had lied. And he was like, of course, my parents are deceased. Who would make that kind of thing up, right? But his denials didn't last very long. He eventually broke and told his wife and his in-laws that he had made it up and that his parents were both still alive. Okay, so what is what's the motivation for this? Well, they didn't want anything to do with the family. And I think that it would be easier for him to have them believe that they passed away rather than they would not attend their wedding. They would have nothing to do with their granddaughter. Mm -hmm. I think that it was a lot of pressure on him. I think Sparkle still had a hope that they would be involved in their lives. And it was their wedding day. I think there was some expectation that if they were alive, they would be in attendance. Okay. An outraged and devastated Sparkle went to stay with her family, not knowing what to make of Ricky's lies. This was crazy to her. But after a week or so, she decided to give her marriage a try and went home to see if she and Ricky could rebuild their trust. She was infuriated, but at some level, she did understand the lie and the pressure that he felt, and she loved him. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, their time to build trust together was also cut short. On the evening of April 26, 2000, Ricky came home from work to a shocking scene. Sparkle lay bleeding and unconscious in the living room of their apartment with their daughter just steps away, thankfully alive and unharmed. Ricky called 911 panic-stricken and then immediately called Donna and Bennett, Sparkle's parents, telling him that Sparkle had been attacked in their home and it wasn't clear if she was dead or alive. From what Ricky could see at the scene, Sparkle had been savagely beaten, strangled, and stabbed several times. How old is the baby at this point? The baby was about seven months. Oh, wow. And unfortunately, Sparkle was pronounced dead when help arrived. Someone had killed her in her own home while her infant watched. And it sounds pretty personal. It does sound personal. Now, obviously, investigators, who is their first suspect going to be? Ricky. Yes. And I have to tell you, Sparkle's family wasn't sure what to think either. I think that a month or so prior, they would have thought, no way. But with the huge lie that he told, they didn't trust Ricky anymore. But being a liar is very different than being a murderer, right? So was Ricky mm -hmm. capable of doing such a terrible thing to the woman he married against his parents' wishes? And why? Well, it also sounds like the parents might be someone we should be looking at. Possibly, yes. Or was this a senseless and brutal crime by an unknown assailant? As the investigation expanded, detectives were able to eliminate certain motives. For example, Sparkle had not been sexually assaulted, and there was no evidence of any sexual element to this crime. So they were able to eliminate a sexually motivated crime. What about forced entry? It did not look like forced entry at first, and nothing was stolen from the home, so robbery was initially ruled out as well. So they couldn't figure out the motive initially, and that's why they also had to talk to Ricky immediately. Now, while we can't totally rely on someone's affect during a stressful or traumatic situation, detectives still felt Ricky's behavior during the 911 call was very odd. You see, he hadn't tried to help Sparkle at the scene, barely touching her when he called 911. And when he was questioned later, he didn't have a good explanation for it. So I guess the operator, the 911 operator was asking him, is she alive? Go tend to her. And he didn't. And he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and he said he just didn't know why he didn't run over to her. He, he said he, he ran to his daughter and that was his instinct. Well, he was probably in shock. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they said, you know, during the interview that he seemed emotionless. OK, I'm not even going to cover all those assessments. So while Ricky looked like a strong suspect at the scene, the police didn't necessarily have any proof that he was responsible. Plus, he had an alibi of being at work at the time of Sparkle's attack. But remember, this is before surveillance technology could pinpoint all the movements of a possible suspect. So just because he'd been at work 
didn't mean that he was innocent. He had a relative alibi, we would say. Mm -hmm. But with no burden of proof to place on Ricky and no DNA and no apparent eyewitnesses, no confessions, the case went cold pretty quickly. And a seemingly distraught Ricky left for Chicago shortly after giving his daughter Anala to Sparkle's parents since he felt he could not care for her. What did he go to Chicago for? I think to rebuild his life. And Sparkle's parents were happy to have their granddaughter, but they were very surprised that he would leave her. And at first he called his daughter to check in, but that changed pretty quickly. It seemed that he no longer wanted to maintain a relationship with her after he moved. That's strange. Also, and again, I'm not assessing judgment on this, but it was reported that Ricky made friends pretty quickly and was enjoying a single life, dating, going out to clubs, things of that nature. And after a little bit of time, he eventually married an Indian woman and settled down in a Chicago suburb. Hmm. That sounds, I don't know. I don't like the way this is sounding. It doesn't sound good. And it didn't, the optics weren't good. He left his daughter behind. He enjoyed a single life. And then he met someone, an Indian woman. Again, his parents, I'm sure, were happy about that. And he settled down in a Chicago suburb to start his new life. So it didn't seem at this point, Amy, that Sparkle's murder would be solvable. Actually, it it could be solvable, right? It just didn't see that it was going to be solved. Mm -hmm. But a seemingly unrelated crime and arrest would lead to the first real break in Sparkle's case four years after her murder. In January 2004, a young woman named Clinique Jackson was arrested on a drug charge. And she had some stunning information for the police. She told investigators that she knew who killed Sparkle Rye. How? Well, she said she witnessed it. According to Clinique, her cousin Cleveland took her and another one of her female friends to the apartment of a young woman. Now, the reason he said they were going there was that he needed their help with a drug deal. And, you know, he basically said, I need you guys to go up and knock on the door and get us in. Something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he basically had the girls knock on the door. They said that they needed to use the bathroom. I'm not really sure still why Sparkle would let two strangers in. But if they were two young women and maybe they knew of each other, or, oh, hey, I know you from so-and-so, mm -hmm. you'd be more likely to let two young females in. Yeah. But what Sparkle didn't see was that Cleveland was behind them. And once the two young women got in the apartment, Cleveland dodged in and he then knocked Sparkle out, according to this eyewitness, strangled her with the cord of a vacuum in her own home and then stabbed her several times with a knife from her own kitchen. This sounds strange to me. The only thing I'm thinking at this point, is this a murder for hire? But also, if it's a murder for hire, why do you not bring a weapon with you? That's exactly what I was thinking. If it's a murder for who goes to a murder for hire and doesn't bring a weapon? You can't rely on someone's vacuum being there or knowing where their kitchen is going to be or knowing where their knives are going to be, you know, anything of that nature. Afterwards, Clinique said that Cleveland collected money from a wire transfer and she overheard him on the phone telling someone it's done. And remember also, Ricky had an alibi, a pretty airtight alibi at the time and couldn't be connected to this. And he happened to come home and find Sparkle several hours after. Luckily for the detectives, Cleveland was already, Cleveland Clark, I believe it was, was already in prison for another offense. And though he refused to speak to investigators when they interviewed him about his stories, the detail of the case were beginning to sound like, again, you had said someone put a hit on Sparkle. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, who was it Ricky? Was it family? Who possibly could have wanted this? Ricky's parents. That's what I'm saying. There's any number mm -hmm. of suspects here that could be related to Ricky. Or again, this could be someone completely unrelated that we don't know about. Mm hmm. Detectives started with the wire transfer that this young woman said she saw Cleveland collect. So they traced it back to find out that Cleveland got this money from a man named Willie Evans. Yet another name, by the way, that was totally unknown to the police. How much money was it? There were a couple of different amounts. So one was $500, one was $700, one was $900. I believe at that time it was the transfers that they traced were about $1,500 to $2,000. Okay. So they brought Willie in for questioning, having no idea how he was related, but he was initially reluctant to speak. So he agreed to meet with law enforcement. He seemed to be getting anxious because they were on his trail a little bit. 
But he asked, could I bring an associate with me, a man named Herbert Green? So the police are like, who's Willie Evans? Who's Herbert Green? And why would you need to bring a, quote, associate with you? And all of these names sound made up. They do, don't they? Yes. Well, hold tight. Okay. So who was he and why would they need to bring him? All these names are starting to sound made up. Well, it turns out that the police were able to find a connection between Herbert Green and someone whose name we've already heard. Can you guess whose name that might be? Uh, I guess Ricky would be too obvious. So I would imagine it would have to be Ricky's parents. That is correct. The connection was between Herbert Green and none other than Sheeman Rye, who is Ricky Rye's father. Apparently, Herbert Green was a good friend and business partner of Ricky Rye's father. Hmm. And what a story Willie and Herbert told. According to the men, Cheeman had contacted Herbert saying that he wanted someone to kill his daughter-in-law, Sparkle. Cheeman had found out about the wedding right after it happened, and he was very, very angry, reportedly. Sparkle and her baby had threatened his reputation and soiled his family name in the Indian community. Hmm. For whatever reasons, Herbert agreed to help his lifelong friend and business partner getting in touch with Willie Evans, who was a friend of his, to see if they could pull this off. By the way, these are real names, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Now, Willie, not the kind to kill by his own hand, called another associate of his, Cleveland Clark. There's a lot of people involved here. Which is surprising then that it took police four years to locate any of them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was really a coincidence. Willie's relation to Cleveland Clark is unknown, but Cleveland Clark had a serious criminal history, violent criminal history. And he agreed to kill Sparkle Rye for $10,000. Now, those wire transfers were significantly less, but that doesn't mean he wasn't paid other ways in other transfers, cash, or other methods of payment. So the plot and the players involved was kind of shocking, but was it actually true? Police, after all, felt like, yes, it made sense that there was a connection, but they didn't really feel like they could take these two guys, Willie and Herbert, at their word. They'd have to prove that their story was real. And to do that, they'd have to get Cheem and Rye to confess. Let me guess, they're going to put a wire on one of these guys. That is correct. Remember, Cheeman is not directly connected to this plot by any means. And though his motive is more obvious than the other men, there's still no real proof. So the police offered these middlemen a deal that involved no jail time if they could get Cheeman to corroborate the story. So this is a pretty sweet deal for helping to Mm -hmm. arrange a murder. Yep. As part of the deal, Herbert Green visited Cheeman while wearing a wire in order to gather the proof that the police needed for his involvement. The pair met at one of Cheeman's hotels. Remember he owned a hotel where Ricky worked? Mm -hmm. This was another one. So apparently he had changed his fields at some point and he owned a couple of different hotels. Herbert told Cheeman that the police had visited his home and they might be on to him. And he said, look, I need $5,000 to get out of town for a bit until things cool down. But Cheeman said he didn't have that kind of money. Note that he didn't say, by the way, well, why would the police visit you? Or why do you have to get out of town? Or what's going on? He just simply said, I don't have $5,000. So Herbert said to Cheeman, well, if I go to jail, so will you. To which Cheeman replied, well, if we have to go to jail, we have to go to jail. So it's not exactly a smoking gun, but the police thought they had enough, especially because he also did give Herbert $500 and he did not sound confused at all about why Herbert would have needed it. Okay. The police thought there was enough evidence to arrest Cheeman Rye, Cleveland Clark, Herbert Green, and Willie Evans for Sparkle's murder. Now, this was 2006. Remember that Herbert and Willie were offered deals for getting Cheeman to admit to the crime. So there were no trials for them. In fact, they were getting sentences of probation in exchange for their testimony. But what do you think Cheeman would do? Trial or plead? I think he'll just try to... Uh, uh, I think he's going to go to trial and he's going to say he's not guilty, having nothing to do with this. That's exactly right. He refused any plea deals and he went to trial in 2008, denying any involvement. So there was no connection between Sparkle and these other men? No, none whatsoever. So the defense is just claiming 100% just innocence? I think you'll see how. So the prosecution alleged that Cheeman killed Sparkle due to racism based on this intense anger that his son was marrying a black woman as opposed to an Indian woman. Mm -hmm. And this brought, you know, shame and dishonor to his family. But many character witnesses came in and testified that Cheeman was not a racist at all. And he'd he'd never displayed such attitudes. These were people who worked with him, worked for him. 
However, that's not exactly convincing evidence. It's one thing also, as pointed out in one of the articles I read, it's one thing to not display overt racism, but to feel racism, or especially as it pertains to one's family members, Mm -hmm. that this might be a different situation for someone like Cheeman. I'm curious if Ricky knew if that's why he ran away. Obviously, I'm going to get to what I think about that. We had Willie Evans and Herbert Green. They testified on behalf of the prosecution about their role in arranging the murder of Sparkle Rye. And as you had mentioned, what was Ricky's thought? Well, he was a central witness to the prosecution's case. He came to testify against his father, though he had moved on with his life, and though I don't think he was happy to be testifying against his father. Were they still estranged, or since he was now with an Indian woman, they were talking again? Yeah, they were no longer estranged. Okay. The family had accepted him back because he married an Indian woman. And according to Herbert Green, that day when he went to visit Cheeman in the hotel, the first thing Cheeman's wife said was, oh, our Ricky's doing wonderful. He's married an Indian woman and settled down now in a suburb. Things are going great. On the stand, Ricky explained that his father had been so disapproving of his relationship with Sparkle that he'd never told his father again about the marriage and his child. Ricky said that he was scared of his family finding out, but I think he was trying to downplay the fact that Sparkle was black and not Indian as a motive because he said that his father was more upset because he wanted his son to finish college and pursue academic and other job opportunities. And the fact of the matter was that Sparkle getting married so young and having a child so young was going to hold him back from returning to college or pursuing other opportunities. So again, he was called by the prosecution, but I don't think he was a necessarily a slam dunk for them. I think he did a little bit to level the playing field here. Now, the defense contended that there was no proof at all that Cheeman did anything here. After all, his hired hitman went to commit a murder with no weapon. That was the big centerpiece here. They said, what kind of hired hitman? would ever do such a thing. So this was odd, and the defense suggested possibly that the other men got caught for their crimes and needed a fall guy, one who just coincidentally was Sparkle's father-in-law. I just don't see what their motive would have been, these guys, if they didn't know Sparkle. Perhaps such loyal friends, especially Herbert was a very good friend of Cheeman's and such a loyal friend, and they saw how distraught Cheeman was over this reputation of his family, being, you know, destroyed. He felt like his family was destroyed. And so he wanted to fix Cheeman's problem. And perhaps that's why, by the way, on these recordings, Cheeman didn't dispute that conversation, but didn't admit to any wrongdoing because he understood what was implied. That makes no sense to me. Yeah, Amy, I have to agree that it seems a little far-fetched here. Um, But again, I think the defense was just hoping that because there was no direct connection, no physical connection, that they could poke holes in the prosecution's theory. And I mean, they were able to poke some holes in it. Nonetheless, the jury still found Cheeman Rye guilty. Now, he was given a life sentence, though the death penalty was on the table at the time. What about his wife? They could not prove that she had any knowledge or involvement in the crime. Okay. So I don't know if that means she had no knowledge or involvement. It also did not appear, just so you know, they investigated, did not appear that Ricky had any knowledge of his father's actions. Okay. In fact, it did appear that Ricky was very, very happy, very much in love with Sparkle and just so distraught. Mm -hmm. He was a young kid. He didn't think he could take care of his daughter. So I think he just wanted to separate himself from the situation. Yeah. Cleveland Clark, the hitman who carried out this brutal crime was also found guilty of murder, but he was not as lucky and he was given the death penalty. As I said earlier, both Herbert Green and Willie Evans received a sentence of probation in exchange for their cooperation. I'm sorry if you said this, but what did Cleveland have to say or he didn't testify? I don't know if he testified at his trial. He simply said that he was not involved. They never had any DNA or forensics connecting him. His connection was the wire transfers the phone call with Herbert Green and the testimony of the two young women, one of whom was his cousin. There was no DNA to match him to that crime scene. They did not find his DNA on the crime scene, hmm. which might imply that he wore gloves. Yeah, I'm not really sure the reason why, but okay. it could have any number of reasons. And they just did not find any DNA connecting him. OK, so with her killer behind bars, Sparkle's family could continue to focus on raising their granddaughter, which they had been doing for a long time. But they also pursued a civil case against Cheeman Rye for the murder of their daughter. And they won a judgment of $2.6 million. Remember, Cheeman was a man of means and he did own some property. And I think they were concerned about taking care of Anala. Mm -hmm. 
Afterwards, Sparkle's father, Bennett Reed, said, quote, the best thing about it is that I finally gotten justice in all areas for Sparkle's murder. So while the family had lost their daughter, they did feel like there was some resolution here. Now, this seemingly senseless crime is very shocking to most of us, right? You have a young mother who's not bothering anyone. She's just happy. She just wants to raise her child and her husband as well. While we can explain it, it's still hard to fathom. But what we can see here as relevant is a cultural clash, right? One in which Ricky Rye's family could not accept his decision to forego an arranged marriage to an Indian bride, as his family so desperately wanted, in particular his father. His siblings had followed in his father's footsteps, both academically, career-wise, and it seems in terms of arranged marriages as well. It appeared that Ricky was the only sibling to step outside of his father's direction. Criminologically, we refer to this as cultural theories of crime, where one's adherence to their culture outweighs the conformity to mainstream culture or society. So our mainstream society is the one, obviously, that establishes laws and norms like you cannot murder because you don't appreciate someone being in your family. Chiman Rai, however, he had a different perceived cultural obligation. And this is not one that all people feel. But in his mind, he was dishonored by his son's decision. And so this tracks as an honor killing, whereby killing Sparkle eliminated the threat to his family honor. He believed that Sparkle was the reason she had brought the shame and dishonor onto his family. So getting rid of her essentially restores honor to the family. Now, I know that we've spoken about this in one or two other episodes, but there are currently about 5,000 honor killings per year. But this was a little bit more atypical in that this was an in-law and not a direct family member that perpetrated the crime. If you recall, I covered the Shafia family murders, and Mm -hmm. this was an instance in which a father, his wife, and his son had murdered his three daughters. So I think usually this is, or the ones we've covered have been males and females who perpetrate these crimes against their daughters or sisters as a direct family member. Mm -hmm. We have to wonder too in the end, and it's a question I always ask, it's very hard to understand this, but this act, did this bring any honor to his family or does it just bring more shame to the family in terms of him getting caught, right? So now he's shamed publicly. Chiman Rai was always known as a reputable man, a smart man, a fair man. People had nice things to say about him. So he, in restoring the honor to his family, what he believes is private honor, he's now dishonored them publicly and kind of destroyed the reputation of his family going forward. Mm -hmm. It's quite the paradox here. In your opinion, do you feel that he was thinking there's no way he would get caught? Yes, I don't think he believed he would get caught. Absolutely. Okay. But he did. And in the end, what we can say for sure is that this act was unnecessary and it broke more than one family relations. And certainly, I don't think there's much honor to be gained from this type of crime. It did take quite some time to resolve this case. It was not easy. There were no eyewitnesses. There was no surveillance technology. The husband looked like an obvious suspect at first as well, especially after he packed up and moved. Police were definitely considering him as their prime suspect. Justice isn't always perfect, as we know, but sometimes it comes in a way we don't expect. For Sparkle, her daughter, and her family, we hope that justice finds them one way or the other. Okay, Amy, that is everything I have for today's case. Did you want to weigh in here with any final thoughts about theory or about the system? I wish that Chiman would have taken accountability for what he did, and that would have been a lot more honorable for me. I don't think he took accountability. However, remember, they moved to the sentencing phase and it was between life and death. So his defense attorney was singing a different tune in that penalty phase. And I believe he was more acknowledging that Cheeman committed this crime, but he did it because he felt like he was doing the right thing for his family, for his son. It was more of an act of desperation. But I do believe I read that there was some acknowledgement, but not by Cheeman. It was in an act to save his life, of course. Yeah. But he did not take responsibility for the crime. Certainly not. And I do wish that he did as well. And the other gentleman, you said he got the death penalty? Yes. Cleveland Clark got the death penalty for this crime. Was he executed or is he still on death row? I believe he's still on death row now. Okay. I should really look into that because it's a great question. As we know, some states at certain times have abolished the death penalty. So Mm -hmm. his sentence may have been converted, although I did not see that at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Either way, he's not going anywhere. No, absolutely not. I'm very happy to hear that the family did receive a settlement. Of course, no amount of money could bring Sparkle back, but at least Anala now, she can be supported financially, being that she doesn't have a mother or a father. And I'm sure it was a very heavy burden, both emotionally and financially, for Sparkle's parents to raise her. Yes, I'm glad that she went with them, though. It seems they were a very loving home, and I'm sure that's exactly where Sparkle would have wanted her to go. Okay. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you to our listeners. But before we go today, we'd like to take this opportunity to answer a question from one of our supporters. Amy, do you have a question for us? Sure. The question we have from one of our supporters is, for your own research area, what is the most interesting finding you have to date? What finding has surprised you the most? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. I love it, by the way. I'm not surprised by anything anymore. So no matter what I research, nothing has surprised me probably in the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years. However, even though I understood certain realities of the justice system for the first several years I was doing my research and even observing like bail hearings and other things, I was totally shocked at just how much power prosecutors have deserved or not. And in some cases it is deserved. Totally shocked that there were people who spent years in jail because they could not afford bail in the amounts of five hundred dollars or, you know, some amount similar to that. And also and I'm still shocked by this. So you know what? I take that back. I still can be shocked by this. I observed a recent bail hearing in which I was very able to clearly see that the judge did not like the defendant. And so he was holding him on much higher bail than I think he would have been held if he did like him. So just that judge's personal feelings, if you if you piss someone off in the courtroom, you're going to pay a price. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess some of those findings really did shock me to see them play out in the real world. And that's no different than any other situation in life, right? If you piss someone off, you're going to pay the price, whether it be the courtroom or, yeah. The consequences here are much different than, oh, you know, a boss maybe not giving you a personal day off. They're, they're mm -hmm. much more substantial in our yeah. line of work. Mine's a little more general. You know, I spent a lot of time researching the effects of wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. And my more recent research in this area has exposed some positives after an exoneration, which seems counterintuitive, but I've been studying a lot about post-traumatic growth oh. and the growth that happens after a traumatic experience. And that's been very interesting to think of. For example, I was surprised to hear that some individuals who have served decades in prison for crimes they haven't commit actually say they wouldn't go back and change anything because that situation has made them the person they are today. And that's incredible to me. So, you know, that was definitely a surprise for me. That's very interesting. I would have to agree. I've heard people say that who did commit the crime, but also say they didn't regret mm -hmm. prison time. So I think that's, yep. that's really a, a positive discovery as well, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. So thanks, Amy. And thank you everyone for listening today. And we'll catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. Sources for today's episode include articles from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, NBC News, an episode of Black Girl Gone, ABC News, and the transcript from Rye v. State, The Appeal.